Now, let's turn to our studio guest here. So the heating shield um, really consists of what kind of materials that can stand the heat of it and in order to, and also to reduce the total weight of it. Well, yes, uh, we uh, use uh, traditional measures in this heating shield called uh, ablative materials. Uh, when, uh, when the uh, aerodynamic heating acting on this heating shield, the material on the shield will be evaporized. When the vapor comes out of the vehicle, uh, the heat will also be taken away mm. uh, from the vehicle. Uh, but uh, also due to this reason, uh, when the temperature is very high, the vapor itself will be uh, ionized to form some uh, plasma sheet to prevent the communication radio waves to passing through. So that is why the uh, blackout area happens in every re-entry uh, of the uh, spacecraft entering the Earth, come back to the, uh, come to, to the Earth. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this kind, uh, kind of phenomena happens on every uh, spaceship and the shuttle. Uh, but don't worry because uh, communication is one thing, but the tracking is another thing. Mm. So we have infrared cameras to uh, measure the uh, precise directions uh, uh, of the uh, of the spacecraft during the blackout area, and also we have a, a very uh, precise reader called the Re Recovery One. Uh, then uh, the name is LM three one three in the main uh, landing site to monitor the uh, the range, the elevation angle, and the atomic angle uh, of the reentry capsule to have a very precise prediction of the landing point, the coordinate. So uh, even during the blackout area, we have a, a very precise measurement of the whole trajectory. Mm, so the material of the heat shield is designed to be burnt out to, to ensure the safety of the astronauts. So my next question is, how can we make sure that the re-entry capsule lands in an upright position instead of falling flat? Well, the capsule is descended by parachute. The parachute hanging point is on the top. Hmm. So it has to be an uh, upright position. Uh, but uh, during the re-entry process, especially in blackout, there's a, 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 a slight thing, zigzagging process yeah. or a, a gliding process that is controlled by aerodynamic design of the, uh, of the heating shell as well as the, uh, the capsule itself and the weight distribution so that the, uh, before it enters the atmosphere it was it is adjusted to such an angle that in the process of blackout or the re-entry where it descends, uh, dec decelerates uh, at the controlled attitude and also there is um, but during the, the blackout process, that would be a little that we can do on board. But before that, we can precisely adjust the, the position of the capsule and to have a, it's a precise prediction of the entry point to the atmosphere as well as the exit point and the landing zone. The little sparkle we're seeing right now on uh, the screen is the re-entry capsule yes. uh, having they, friction uh, with the atmosphere, creating an uh, enormous amount of heat as well as light and, and, and plasma. This is shows that the uh, our op optical uh, telescopes on the ground has already ca successfully captured the reentry capsule. Uh, so the reentry capsule is already in our sight. Yes, and you can see the long, long trail is the uh, in vaporized uh, ablative materials uh, just behind the vehicle. How heavy is the heat shield? And also comparing to the whole reentry capsule, a big por proportion of its weight is the heat shield. Uh, Mr. It's, Xu. Yeah, I think it's about uh, uh, 50 to uh, 500 to 600 uh, kilograms. But uh, but the uh, the capsule itself is much heavier mm. than the heating shell. The reach entry capsule is about three ton uh, level. Uh, it's a little bit heavier than the re-entry capsule of the Soyuz uh, spaceship. So now, Shenzhou spaceship is the uh, most heavy uh, manned uh, crewed spacecraft uh, just in use of the human being. We, we all have a common sense that the heavier the re-entry capsule is, the powerful this whole process of landing would be. And because you see that we can monitor the uh, the, the traje uh, traje uh, trajectory of the reentry capsule through the uh, infrared camera, so the uh, the landing uh, coordinate can all be updated very frequently. So the uh, the final one will be uh, when the main parachute is deployed. So they will have a very uh, precise prediction of the landing site. Now we're seeing uh, a blackout stage for the astronauts in the reentry capsule, but everything is under control in this room. This is the Beijing Aerospace.
command and control center, a big screen there are simulating the whole trajectory of the reentry capsule entering atmosphere. The whole blackout stage uh, is about 10 minutes when it enters the atmosphere uh, of a height of 80 kilometers above ground to 40 kilometers above ground. From the voice of the flight control room, we can hear that the uh, optical telescope has already captured the, uh, uh, the, the reentry capsule. Uh, because in different ground stations, we have not only one uh, telescope, and we have many readers to monitor the whole reentry process. So all the uh, observation stations are reporting that they have already located and, and see the reentry capsule. The recovery tool is a USB uh, TT and C uh, facilities. What does that mean? Uh, it means uh, uh, the universal S-band uh, uh, telemetry, telecontrol, and communication, uh, which is a, a common uh, data link between the ground and the spacecraft. So just now you've heard that the command said the, the main switch has been switched on for the recovery, recovery switch. That is uh, happening at about 50 kilometers above sea level. So we're seeing the blackout uh, ending at any minute. Hmm. When this blackout phase uh, is over, the two astronauts can, can talk to the ground control? Exactly. They can send signal to the center. Uh, hmm. uh, in fact, they're sending the signal to the center once they're out of the black, uh, hmm. blackout. And uh, they have to make a, 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 a what we would call a recoverable switch on, a power switch on, uh, manually by the two astronauts at the, at the command of the control center. And uh, at, at about 10 kilometers is the deployment of the parachute. So they have another 30 to 40 kilometers to, to descend before they deploy it. They, they blow open the, the shield of the parachute and the opening of the parachute. Hmm. Now they're about to that they're about to go out to the blackout zone and at about the height of 10 kilometers the parachute will be opened and they will be waiting for their final descent. Because the parachute is so important, so we we have not only have a main parachute, we can we also have a backup parachute. If the main parachute, as Yin Song had mentioned, if the hatch cannot open properly, we can use the backup chute to ensure the safety of the astronauts. And for each set of the chute, we have the uh, deacceleration chute, the guiding chute, and also the main chute. And the uh, area of the main chute is about 1,200 square meters, so it is very huge. Well, sometimes it's like jumping from an airplane when you do the parachute uh, descending. Uh, and you uh, always have a backup parachute with you. Uh, but this parachute is extremely big. It's the size of three basketball fields. Yes. And Yang Liwei, Mr. Yang Liwei told that uh, the most uh, strong impact happened during the, deploy, uh, the moment mm -hmm. that the main shoot deployed. So although the, uh, during the reentry procedure, they suffered the uh, acceleration about the 3 to 5G, but the most uh, strong impact happened during the deployment of the main shoot. Any kind of technical improvements can be made to I mean, better, uh, better help the astronauts to, 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 to cope with this impact? Well, the physical uh, fitness of the astronauts, I would say. <laughs> uh, and also, there's a, no, a number of uh, uh, things that we can do, but uh, has to be find a precise uh, break-even point of economic uh, break uh, you know, returns and the, the efficiency of the process. At, at this moment, you can see this uh, free fall of the capsule. Mm. It's already out of the blackout. And and this, is great. this is a simulation of uh, the opening of the parachute which means now the re-entry re capsule is at a height of 10 kilometers above ground. The main parachute has successfully been opened. This is uh, uh, from the ground. So the tracking station are reporting that everything is normal and under control. Now as the parachute opens, uh, it's less than 10 kilometers from the sky to the ground. And the next uh, critical step will be the jettisoning of the heating shield. It the heating shields will be detached from the re-entry capsule. They will be ditching uh, the heating shield. Yes, because the main, sh main parachute has already been successfully deployed, so the heating shield has uh, completed its uh, mission. 
and with the uh, jettisoning of the heating shield, we will uh, continue to keep the normal temperature in the cabin. During previous missions, after the heat shield is uh, is dumped and detached from the re-entry capsule, it's always uh, collected in order to examine and, and study it. So what kind of experiment will be done to the heat shield that is already, uh, that will be uh, dumped in this process? It will be also retrieved to study the uh, uh, whole uh, re-entry process. It is a very uh, valuable sample uh, for the to study the uh, uh, very accurate parameters of the whole re-entry procedure. And uh, after that, uh, when the uh, re-entry capsule is one meter above the ground, the uh, retro solid rocket, the four retro rocket, uh, solid rocket will ignite, and the gamma ray altimeter will control this. So the ground uh, control center is now updating the exact location of the re-entry capsule's landing point. They're keeping this update uh, every few minutes according to the trajectory of this free fall. Now you can see cloud in the sky, so they're very, very close to the ground. Hmm. Uh, as we mentioned, because we have many readers and also optical uh, telescopes monitoring the whole landing process, so we can update the landing coordinates very uh, constantly and have more uh, accurate results. And you can see this infrared image that you can see the very bright spot is the reactive capsule and the, because the temperature of the uh, parachute is also very high, so you can, you can see also the whole uh, parachute is very bright. Now the search and rescue team in the northern part of China's Inner Mongolia oh, autonomous oh, region oh, are oh. anxiously awaiting for the two astronauts and the re-entry capsule. Oh. Now we're hearing from the command center. They're counting down to the next move. So how long will this process uh, take, Mr. Xu? Well, this, uh, the whole process, like I said, is about 10 minutes, but uh, once it's uh, below temperatures, it's just uh, to the parachute gliding about four or five minutes. Mm. And a search and rescue team uh, have already arrived at the landing site. This is a simulation of the re-entry capsule and like its the main mission. parachute. So the color of the parachute is exactly the same as we're seeing. Is it? Uh, it's quite similar. Uh, the uh, the 3D but 3D uh, simulation uh, can represent the uh, the normal condition uh, because we use the uh, telemetry data to present this 3D uh, animation. And the next uh, critical step will be the uh, raising of the seats of the astronauts to uh, have uh, uh, energy dumping of the impact on the ground. And so also to provide a cushion effect for the astronaut yes. to cope with the impact when it hit the ground. And this time uh, is quite different from the former missions because this time, for the first time, we used to a medical to also to attend this uh, rescue uh, procedure. Uh, in the years before, we used uh, uh, manned uh, fixed wing uh, aircrafts and uh, helicopters uh, for the whole uh, recovery procedure. But this time, a manned air vehicle also attends this procedure. So in the future, when we are having more and more space missions, some of these search and rescue team can be consist of a lot of drones and unmanned vehicles as well as uh, yes. aircrafts. This and sometimes they can be more precise. And this can also save a lot of money because we need uh, fewer crew than before. That sounds like a robotic mission to other planets. You know, you can have UAVs and you can have rovers and uh, landers or unmanned and robotic missions. Well, the robotics are playing more and more important roles in space exploration, especially to harsh environments. Is that dark uh, portion of this image the horizon? I'm not quite sure, but it looks like that they are approaching the ground and in 
uh, we can hear from the commander that's recovery four uh, tracking the vehicle very normally. Uh, uh, recovery four is the he helicopter. Uh, which can just uh, be very close to the reentry capsule. Mm, the helicopter that is patrolling the whole landing site yes. and on the ground uh, is the search and rescue team, the medical team as well. So after the reentry capsule touches the ground, the two astronauts will be sitting inside the reentry capsule just to recover a little bit from the whole process of reentry, of, of, of friction, of the impact of the parachute, of the impact of its hitting the ground. So um, they will be sitting there taking their breath and, and do what, Mr. Xi? Well, they would be uh, thinking about gravity. You know, yeah. they, after a month and three days of uh, microgravity or no gravity, or floating around, they would feel that they're, they're back home. I mean, mm. they, they, they feel their own weight for the first time in a month. So they, they would be recovering for, for um, orientations and, uh, and positionings. And I think uh, uh, the capsule, once land, probably will be on the side, uh, in most cases, because in some uh, windy uh, areas, uh, the wind can blow the capsule to the side. And there's a, also a manual detachment of the, cap, uh, of the parachute by the astronauts uh, after landing. So they would be uh, uh, making a few moves uh, make sure that they, uh, they're physically fit uh, and can go out of the capsule and they have to help open the, the hatch. But the hatch can be opened from outside, but they, they can, you know, wave to the outside and make sure that they, they're, they're safe and they're sound back home and they have to report to the control center that they have landed. Just to do a few stretches as well. And also during previous missions, we can see sometimes the astronaut actually can manage to walk out of the reentry capsule, a sign of uh, healthy, uh, a sign of really the courage of doing the whole process. And for the audience that are watching this, uh, it means the successful of this mission. It also means a kind of a patriotic feeling as well. Uh, well, uh, this happens only in some early missions, such as Shenzhou 5, 6, and 7. Uh, you see that uh, stay longer in space, uh, since Shenzhou 9 mission stay nearly two weeks in space. Uh, if you come uh, t when after touching down, if you go out very uh, soon, it will be very dangerous for the astronauts. As Yen Song have mentioned, they have been adapted to the microgravity environment, and the re-adapting uh, procedure for the astronauts will be a very long procedure for them. And if they move very fast, uh, it's quite not, not good for their healthy. So uh, they will keep staying in the reentry capsule until the rescue team come there. And uh, because uh, you see that we use the gamma ray altimeter to control the solid rocket engines uh, igniting uh, one meter above the ground. So uh, the first step for the ground crew when they reach the uh, reentry capsule is to uh, block the uh, radiation source with the uh, cover. Uh, to prevent, to avoid the uh, uh, hurt of the radio, uh, radiation to anybody. So you may notice that in every mission, uh, the ground crew never come to the other side of the uh, Shenzhou spacecraft uh, just after landing. This is, a, this is a, a look from outside the helicopter which is patrolling um, above the landing site and from the ground search vehicle that we're seeing right here is dashing towards the landing site and from Beijing Aerospace Command and Control Center it could be any minute before the touchdown. From the simulation that we're seeing here they have already updated a landing a touchdown uh, exact point because it is already very low so the uh, recovery tool has uh, finished its tracking procedure. So just now, about four, uh, four or five minutes ago, you heard a, a countdown. That is a process for the astronauts to, uh, to prepare the suspension of the chair, to lift their chair to a higher position where it can be uh, experiencing the impact on, on landing. I believe from the ground team, um, the one who's in the search vehicles, uh, the re-entry capsule as well as this huge gigantic parachute is already in sight, right? They can yeah. see. Yes, I think uh, even, uh, I would say the helicopter is probably even higher than the, 
and then the astronauts yeah. now, and they can see it from the different angles, and they will fly to the to the landing area. Uh, I think there, there was a, a, a contingency plans of the the landings, and many of the landing has been pre-designated. Uh, and two days ago, we uh, we have conducted a, a exercise of uh, search and rescue of the astronauts. So you could see now is uh, the optical. Uh, uh, I think it's the. Uh, instead of infrared, they're they're switching to telescope mm. uh, to search the, the capsule. Well, the weather condition is pretty ideal for for the whole process. This wind is not swifter than 15 meters per second. The visibility is more than 10 kilometers. As you have introduced, the wind is a very important factor for the mm. whole recovery procedure because uh, with the influence of the wind, uh, the landing coordinate can be quite different from the design one. So this, is, also, this is a telescope from, uh, I believe it's from the helicopter. Just catch the, the wheel. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering where this camera came from. And Tianlian also plays an important role in uh, this recovery because the video signals we, we can see also can communi uh, uh, send it back through the Tianlian uh, data relay satellite. You're seeing recovery team on wheels are on the way to the landing site. Mm. So the touchdown can happen any minute now. So maybe uh, it's cloudy in the main landing area, so uh, only the infrared can see, uh, can ca uh, catch the image of the range capsule very nobly. So the, uh, so the camera of the visible light uh, cannot work so perfect like the infrared camera. So and the visibility is not quite ideal for, for this uh, landing. Not very ideal, and uh, we should uh, also notice that this is the first time we China Aerospace recover the Shenzhou spaceship in winter. Mm. So it's quite cold in Inner Mongolia, and we have already adopted uh, corresponding measures to keep the astronauts warm when they come out of the cabin. Yes, according to weather forecast, a uh, uh, cold front is coming from the northwestern part of China, and I believe it has already uh, reached Xinjiang. A weak autonomous region as well as in the Mongolia and it will be coming to Beijing in a few days. But the good thing of the cold front is it can cool down the capsule sooner than, than, than expected. And the, the bad thing is that uh, the infrared signal can lose very quickly because it doesn't provide any heat prints uh, f for the infrared camera. So they're, they're looking for the itself and still searching but I think they're probably in the parameter of the landing zone. Does that mean that the, the re-entry capsule hardware had already touched down? Or are they still in, in the air and searching? I, I'm not sure if they have touched down. I, I think they're still, they're still uh, not touched down yet because if you, uh, you see the touchdown for, Four of the, uh, the uh, anti-thrust, if you like to call it, would fire and you would see the, a very dusty area uh, of the touchdown area. In Mongolia is actually described to be an ideal place uh, for landing because of its vast flat grassland. But during winter time, the grass, the grass is gone and, and all that's left is, is sand. But still, the geographical condition is pretty, pretty <laughs> ideal for, for the landing. It was tr chosen because it's, it's less populated. You don't mm. want to <laughs> land the capsule on, on top of anyone's house. So uh, it's an area that you can, you can do uh, whatever you, want, you like, uh, basically, with the, with the capsule. And it's an area that you can do search and rescue without uh, considering the human casualties on the ground. Well, as Professor Young has mentioned earlier, uh, the United States actually chose to land on sea, but China chose to land on land. 
So uh, what is the consideration here? Well, uh, both uh, landing on the ground and the splash, uh, splashdown uh, on the sea have its own uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, splashdown on the sea will be much simpler uh, for the touching down and also uh, for the cooling down of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. But you see, uh, a splashdown on the ground uh, on, the, on the sea need a very huge rescue team. It's not feasible for uh, countries, uh, especially for a developing country like China. Uh, but in the future, we see uh, a spaceship become uh, more and more large. Uh, in the future, maybe we also can choose this splashdown on the sea. Uh, but for a small uh, spaceship like the Soyuz and our Shenzhou spaceship, uh, it can be landed on the ground. The disadvantage is that the impact on mm -hmm. the ground will be much higher than on the sea. And also, we need uh, an additional procedure, as we mentioned, the jettisoning of the heating shield. So it's more complex than uh, touching down uh, on, the, on the sea. Uh, so we need the retro solid uh, rocket uh, to uh, continue to uh, slow down the vehicle when it touches the ground. So that is why we choose the gamma ray altimeter to control the ignition of the uh, solid rocket engine uh, when it touching down. And because of this, uh, there are radiation on the bottom of the Shenzhou spaceship. And we must avoid the hurt of the radiation when it's touching down. Indeed, if it's splashed down on sea, uh, the search and rescue can be really fa vast because you have to deal with the wave as well. The, the exactly, torrent, uh, but the, the torrents of, yes. of the sea waves. Uh, but you see, uh, as we have discussed, uh, in emergency case, you don't have a choice. So the astronauts must be trained uh, when they uh, splash down on the sea, and they must uh, can survive depending purely on themselves mm. uh, when they touch down. As you mentioned, maybe the rescue team uh, can only find them after a very long period. So they have uh, ability, capability to survive under these circumstances. Inside the re-entry capsule, are there any emergency kits? Exactly. They, For their survival they, in, inside uh, they the re-entry capsule? Ha uh, they have their food, communication devices, and they even have a gun. To, uh, to keep them safe, because maybe they are a beast in a uh, uh, very wild field. Maybe it's not for killing themselves, but all the animals. <laughs> but at this moment, I would say that the uh, capsule probably has landed already, and mm. the search and rescue team is looking for the landing site. The ca helicopter, as well as the ground crew, is, uh, is uh, running around in the search mode for, to, to find the capsule. What we talk about uh, do happen in the years before. Uh, Mr. Uh, Alexey Leonov, uh, when he performed the first EVA of human being in space, when he comes back, the ground team cannot find the re-entry capsule. And they stayed in uh, uh, very heavy snow for so long time, and then they survived. And they, e they were even eaten by the wolves. So it's very dangerous for them when they come back. So the food on board, the food and, and life supplies on board can help them survive how yes. many days? Uh, they can, uh, the food and water uh, and also other necessary equipment can support them stay uh, maybe two days or more uh, in independently. Oh, well, I'm wondering, is this longer than normal, the search and, and locating of the re-entry capsule? I would say it's, uh, it looks like uh, it's longer. Uh, Previously, we had launched uh, the missions that we really recorded to the last minute. Well, oh, this is pretty inaudible. So the Beijing Command Center. It's, it's pretty inaudible. Okay, from what we're seeing right here, um, we have successfully located the re-entry capsule. And that's uh, also according to the ground search team. As I said, it's uh, already in the tilted uh, position mm. as reported by the search and rescue team. That was just a a quick glimpse of the re-entry capsule as well, its parachute. Uh, this is a very normal condition because uh, because you see that 
to uh, to achieve a semi ballistic reentry, the ma the center of the mass of the uh, reentry capsule uh, must have a deviation from the uh, symmetric axis of the uh, of the whole vehicle. So uh, when it touched down the ground. A report from the ground team saying that the re-entry capsule has successfully touched us down. They're, they're, they're updating the exact location of the altitude, the longitude and altitude. So we've heard it's been separated from the capsule itself, which is a good, sig a good sign of the safety of the astronauts, uh, because it has to be done manually by the astronauts. Well, this is uh, taking longer than usual, but it's probably because of the visibility of Inner Mongolia on this day. Usually an ideal visibility would be more than 10 kilometers, but it looks pretty misty and cloudy there in Inner Mongolia. And it's also the first time China has, has conducted a, a landing maneuver in wintertime. It seems that one of the helicopter has landed near the reentry capsule. And because you, you see that in northern China, there are smarks uh, in, in these days. So uh, it's natural that uh, we can not have a very clear uh, video from the uh, landing site. Oh uh, yes, yeah, so a smoggy day is not only bad for your health, but also not ideal for the search and rescue operation that we're seeing right here. But in the case of this, couldn't a radar or any infrared search uh, machine that can do the job the uh, the reader and the uh, infrared cameras can only work when it's in the sky uh, because uh, the uh, when it is uh, already touched down it's too low for these kind of sensors uh, to see uh, to see the uh, the spacecraft so uh, but we have uh, radio signals from the capsule. So a report from the Beijing Command Center is summar a summary of what has just happened. The voice that you've just heard is saying that the reentry capsule is in a tilted position. The parachute has already separated from the reentry capsule, uh, which means that the astronaut has successfully conducted this manual separation process. Um, it has also reported that the landing site is very flat. One of the helicopters has successfully landed. Does that mean everything is within control? Everything is uh, going on smoothly? Uh, okay. At least from now, we can see that it's a very normal condition. Uh, you see, uh, the, uh, the cutting of the uh, parachute will be very important to avoid the wind dragging the uh, reentry capsule uh, from moving. Mm. Uh, so uh, this means that the uh, Shenzhou spaceship is still in a normal uh, reentry procedure. Uh, and also we have, uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, rescuing signals from the capsule. And this is an update uh, of the position. So the updating of these data can help the search and rescue team to locate uh, exactly where, where the re-entry capsule is. I'd like to continue what we discussed earlier. Uh, you, you mentioned that the infrared as well as the, uh, the radar system can only be operated while the re-entry capsule is in the air. Yes. Not on the ground, but um, just from an outsider, an amateur view, can, can't we just bring in GPS, simply a GPS on board? Yes, we can. In fact, uh, the 
capsule itself supposed to to broadcast this uh, position. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, with GPS, at, at the current we uh, we're using the GPS uh, with the with the mobile phone. We use uh, along with the the, the GSM uh, signals, mm -hmm. GMS signals. So the GPS outside is is more complicated because it doesn't have a, a phone signal. Mm. So you can't use cellular system to precisely enhance the position. But uh, at current p capabilities of, of the Chinese navigation system, Beidou, we can certainly use that uh, to, uh, to navigate. And even to not only on the ground, we can navigate satellites uh, with the GPS system. And you're exactly right. We can certainly use GPS. But currently, we are st still using the, uh, uh, the the positioning of the of the ground uh, by by the latitude and altitude. And uh, and what you mentioned, the uh, updated coordinates uh, may be sent by the helicopter first uh, landed near the capsule, and the updated coordinate will help the other ground team, other helicopter helicopters and the ground vehicles to come to the uh, site more uh, rapidly. Because there's a whole convoy of vehicles, helicopters, peoples, uh, cranes to take the people in the capital back. So, is that boy saying two more uh, helicopters successfully landed? Yes. Which, which probably means that more um, helicopters have already located. With the help of the uh, coordinated reported by the first uh, helicopter landed near mm. the uh, vehicle, uh, other helicopters and more ground vehicles come closer to the uh, landing landing point. And I believe that we can see the images of the capsule very soon because there are uh, visible light cameras on the helicopter and also on other ground vehicles. The communication on the stage is pretty critical. Because the landing zone is about 200 kilo square kilometers, it's a large area. Sometimes mm. take 20 to 30 kilometers, uh, 30 minutes to, to get to the to the site. And this time, it seems to be a, a pretty remote area where the helicopter has to get there first, rather than ground vehicles. Like I said earlier, the communication is uh, pretty crucial on this stage. You can see that uh, from this image uh, on the upright hand side is the predicted landing area, and uh, on the left uh, low side is the reported landing area. So they, everyone has to, uh, you know, it previously was at the predicted area, has mm. to move everything to the exact uh, actual landing site. So it's a, it's a, it's a driving process. Mm -hmm. Even though this this margin is considered acceptable. Yes, uh, because as you mentioned about the uh, 15 meter per second uh, limit of the wind speed, uh, so uh, everything is in uh, desi uh, designed margin, uh, within the designed margin. Uh, but uh, you see, uh, the ground team always standing by near the predicted theoretical landing point. Mm. Uh, so ne they need some time to go from the theoretical one to the real one. Now let's take a look at, at what we're seeing right here. The blue font on the upper right hand side means the predicted landing site and the, uh, the green font that we're seeing on the lower part means that the exact touching down point of the re-entry capsule. But the coordinates has already been updated to the ground control center as well as all the search vehicles and helicopters. So uh, I believe during this process as we're waiting, they're eagerly dashing towards that exact landing point. Uh, one more helicopter has landed. Has landed near the exact touchdown point. So one more helicopter successfully landed. Okay, I we believe this is the image that we're seeing, the parachute. The white and red parachutes and the re-entry capsule. A round of applause for a round of applause for the successful landing and locating capsule. Outside of the hatch, 
our uh, technicians as well as medical teams. Opening up the hatch. I believe a brief health checkup is yes. done in this process. Uh, the, uh, they will check the integrity of the reentry capsule. And there are many operations uh, because the uh, propellants uh, has already been uh, uh, laid out uh, when the parachute uh, deployed. So uh, they will check if there are uh, still have some uh, poisonous propellants uh, outside the capsule. And also, as I mentioned, they will cover the radiation source uh, to keep the safety of the ground team. How many people, how many personnel are involved in, in this search and rescue operation? Hundreds? Well, hundreds, yes. Hmm. I think they're separated into three or four teams, and each team will be uh, designated to specific areas. And there's also a, a, a team of uh, people that is in charge of the uh, astronauts' health, and there's another team who's in charge of the sol uh, sovereign, uh, the capsule back to the a designated location for further studies. Mm -hmm. So there is all uh, helicopters and ground crews and all has to work simultaneously along with the telecommunication system. And like Professor Young mentioned, uh, a couple of UAVs has been deployed and we're seeing uh, pictures at this moment from one of the UAV. Uh, because the landing site is very near to my home city, Hohat, and also there is a larger hospital in my uh, home city uh, and uh, many crews there are standing by for any emergency cases they will uh, have medical care of the astronauts if anything uh, wrong happens. So you see, as you see the parachute you can have a comparison with the previous uh, um, sim simulated parachute colors. The, the, color, mm -hmm. the bright color of the parachute really helps uh, in locating the capsule itself because it's much larger than the capsule itself. And the capsule itself, once on the ground, looks like a piece of rock. But the parachute is very bright. And I would say that a visual uh, search would be most focusing on the parachute rather than the capsule itself. So from this video we're seeing right now, uh, some of the personnel are wearing orange, some in blue. Um, are, are the orange ones the emergency crew, the firefighter team, the first responder, and the blue ones are uh, medical and technical team? But there are two teams. One is uh, responsible for the uh, opening of the hatch, uh, and those are what we call an engineering team. And the other, other group uh, would be responsible for uh, assisting the astronauts uh, have EVAs on the ground, I mean, outside of the capsule. Uh, was uh, carrying the astronauts outside the capsule. So I think at this moment you can see the hatch is the open. The hatch is open, yes. Hmm. According, to, according to the report uh, from the ground, uh, it, it says that the re-entry capsule is intact. Um, the exterior of it looks intact and the hatch has already been opened. Well, you can see from the capsule uh, on the lower part, some of the parts has been burned mm. into black color. So mm. those are in the blackout and re-entry process where it's like a, a firing process has been experienced on the capsule. But the, the report says the integrity of the capsule has not been broken. so. It's intact, and uh, that should uh, guarantee the safety and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, unsafe return of the astronauts. I believe during this time, the astronauts are adjusting to the gravity uh, as, well, as well as this the low temperature in Inner Mongolia at this moment? Uh, as we mentioned, the, most, uh, uh, the biggest problem is that they have stayed in space more than one month. Mm. So the re-adapting the gravity environment will be the most tough task for the two astronauts. Will a medical team perform a, a brief health checkup for the astronauts after the hatch is opened? 
Yes, they will asking the astronauts about their feelings uh, at the present stage, and also they will help, uh, for instance, to, to provide some water or some food for them if they are thirsty, and also they will check the uh, physical basic status of the astronauts and then help them to get out of the cabin. We can see uh, some medical kit has been brought to the hatch, as well as stretcher, chairs, a national flag has been raised. And because the, uh, the, the volume of the re-entry capsule is too small, so that only uh, one additional ground crew can enter in the capsule astronauts. The tracking of the Tiangong 2 space lab uh, was terminated, according to the ground report. This is a quite a patriotic moment for everyone who's watching this, uh, especially for the youngsters, the children. Well, all space mission has its own purpose. Scientific experiment is on one hand, educational is on the other. Yes, they have already, I believe they have already brought the five cocoons of the silkworms back to the Earth. <laughs> They're born in space, actually. Yes. So the capsule has already touched down on Earth in China's northern Inner Mongolia autonomous region. The hatch is already open, but we're still waiting for the two astronauts to come out of the re-entry capsule. According to uh, the feedback from two astronauts, they're feeling okay, and actually they themselves open up the hatch instead of the ground team. So the hatch was opened up from inside. This means that the two astronauts are in a very good condition because they even have the capability to open the hatch mm. by themselves. And the, the, hatch is pretty, the hatch is pretty heavy, which means they still have a lot of strength On the other after hand, a 30-day yes. stay in space. Mr. Xu. Pro probably got too bored because the, astro the rescue team didn't come on time. <laughs> <laughs> so they, yes, they, they cannot wait any more seconds. They want to yeah. see Earth. They want to see and their motherland. They, they want to get some air. So a look from outside the hatch. That also like our Professor Young has mentioned earlier, only one ground team member uh, can enter the re-entry capsule because of the space limit. All the other team outside are busy recording any data, talking to the Beijing Aerospace Command and Control Center, reporting on the health condition uh, as well as other data collected from the re-entry capsule. And this also means that the uh, physical exercise in space, they perform every day in space, is very effective to keep them healthy and for, to help them to uh, re-adapt the uh, gravity environment more rapidly. Hmm. So this will be uh, a recognized a good preparation for the future uh, space station program because the expedition team will stay in our future space station for half a year uh, in every turn. Yes, uh, Professor Young here uh, is talking about the routine uh, gym that the astronauts have been doing during their 30 day in space. They were working before landing on Earth. They were working 10 days, 10 hours per day, six days per week. And apart from that, it's all their private time. They can do some, uh, they can walk and run on treadmills. They can do stretches and talk to their, uh, to, the, to their family. Yes. I believe they have been enjoyed their life in space. Uh, and also, uh, Mr. Jing Haipeng and Mr. Chen Dong express their pity that it, it is pity they leaving their home in space. Uh, but it is also good to return a real home. Yes, of course. A 30-day stay is considered a midterm stay uh, on, on an international scale. China has already, well, from this stage that we're seeing right here, successfully tested the midterm stay of astronauts living in space. And in the future, when China establishes its own space station in orbit. It means astronauts will be staying there for a couple of months or 
sometimes half a year, yes. that can be really challenging. And if China is aiming to establish its own space station, uh, another key point is, of course, is the refueling and the cargo transmission from, uh, from the ground to space. So after the two astronauts come out of the re-entry capsule, uh, a lot of health tests and, and experiments are awaiting them. They will be bring back to the Wen Tiangu, where they no. will uh, they will be bring back to uh, a facility that will, that will that they can that they are still staying for a couple of days, even weeks. Uh, they will be taken back by the helicopters to the airport near Hukuhot, uh, and then they will take a common aircraft fly back to Beijing, and then to the space city uh, in the uh, northern part of Beijing, and stay there uh, to continue their reacting procedure to the uh, gravity environment. So how long would this process be? Uh, maybe several hours. I, I, mean, I mean, they will be living in a facility to do more uh, especially health tests there yes. to readapt to the gravity environment. That would take days. That would take days, days or even weeks. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. the, the also there will be a, a debriefing process for the astronauts who have done and conducted their mission uh, on in ground uh, in the orbit, and they have to report on uh, all the details they have done uh, to the Tengun Two station and some of the uh, the experiments uh, as Tengun Two is continuing functioning. And the coming day, a coming year, in April will be uh, or you know, June will be launching a cargo ship to the Tengun Two yeah. to maintain its uh, operations. So a lot of things has to be debriefed and uh, the report has to be formulated, so that the, the follow-on job can be conducted. It seems like a lot of follow-on follow jobs uh, are awaiting them, but it's years. Of training before they enter the space, and it's weeks and months of debriefing. Follow afterwards. Will they have any vacation after the successful mission? Well, every day would be considered a vacation because <laughs> that's their job, and they they enjoyed it. I I, I presume they would very much enjoy that um, uh, the exercise they do every day <laughs> and the. Uh, well, I, th I think some of the experiments and the exercise are very tough for them, but uh, I guess it's their career and their brotherhood among other astronauts. Uh, I think they very much enjoyed that life uh, in, in, in the campus of the astronauts. And the first batch of astronauts of China have 14 crew members. And they are performing the communication test. Mm. And both, both sides say the, the voice is pretty audible and clear. It is a really pity that not all these 14 persons can have the chance to go into space. But I always uh, say that it's already a great honor for them mm. being chosen as an astronaut, even if he has never been to space. Because there are little, so, uh, little chances to go to space. Uh, and we do have uh, uh, some of our astronauts, like Mr. Wu Jie, who will not be having the chance to go to space. As we have landed the astronauts, the, uh, the Russian, uh, Russian Soyuz is sending a crew to the ISS uh, in the coming hours. So probably have already confirmed that, that yesterday, as uh, we had a teleconference yesterday, and the astronauts are already in, in Baikonur in Kazakhstan. Landing, uh, launching site. Well, the two chairs that we're seeing, the two white chairs that we're seeing, indicates that uh, the two astronauts can can be brought out any seconds now. Just now we see some catering service. It looks like they're having lunch inside <laughs> the capsule, but I'm not sure if they brought in our bread or something else. But uh, looks like they, after. A month of starvation, they probably feel very hungry and looking for some earthly food. <laughs> not those toothpaste, and not those toothpaste of food anymore. Yeah. It's actually 2.30, 2 p.m. here in Beijing. And in, in Mongolia, it, it's, it's winter time. The wind is now yeah, blowing strong. pretty strong, uh, judging from the flags. And different from the previous missions, this time uh, in the previous missions, the, the re-adapting procedure of the astronauts mainly uh, in the cabin, 
but this time uh, most of the, uh, as uh, as mentioned by the uh, crew from the China Astronaut Center, uh, most of this procedure will be performed in the helicopter. Uh, this is also due to the reason what you mentioned, because this is in winter, it will be quite cold outside. And this readjusting procedure will be longer than usual, because they have spent 30 days. That's the longest time expansion that Chinese astronauts has ever experienced. Just now, we heard voice from the astronaut himself. So welcome back, and uh, we have a very gratitude to see you back in a very good condition. See you in Beijing. See you in Beijing. From the voice of the astronaut, it sounds good. Like they're very in a very good shape. Yes, that, that's a very that's a very loud, <laughs> yeah, very loud breathing, goodbye. Very loud <laughs> breathing. We just heard the voice of Mr. Jing Haipeng, full of confidence and strength. Yes, this is a veteran. He has been in space three times before. Yes, and he hopes that because he go to space every year, after, uh, every time after the Olympic Games, so he hopes that uh, after the next Olympic Games he will have the chance to go to spe space. At that time, will be our future space station in 2020. Yes, China is aiming to uh, establish its own international space station by the year of 2022. And um, by then, the International Space Station, the International Space Station is, is still uh, in the orbit. Its retirement has been postponed to 2028. It was originally set for 2022. But that can bring a huge opportunity to China uh, in the future. By the year 2020, uh, 2030, Chinese uh, space station will be the only orbiting space station. Uh, because uh, you know that uh, I have many friends uh, in other countries. As the astronauts are uh, pay their attention to China's space activities, especially the manned space activities. My friends even begin to uh, learn Chinese <laughs> because they hope that in the future they have the chance to visit China's space station. Sometimes when we see in movies, each country's spacecraft has its own control panel. And gravity, um, Sandra Bullock. The actress in this movie, she actually entered one of our own space uh, spaceship and controlled the, the whole spaceship by learning Chinese and looking at the manual and con and doing some controlling on the Chinese control panel. So that may be what you're saying about your internet, about your foreign friends, about your foreign astronauts that is ain't that's keening that is keen to learn Chinese. Uh speaking, uh, many of my uh, friends uh, in other countries complain about that they have to learn Russian uh, when they come to the ISS. They always complain that it is a very tough task for them. So the control panel in our spaceship is indeed in Chinese? Uh, yes, indeed, it's in Chinese. Uh, I think there's no linguistic requirement for the astronauts. Uh, but the, the cooperation between European Space Agency and China in, in human space missions is that the European astronauts are starting. Mm. Um, but there, there's a, in the International Space Station, I mean, every country speaks their own language, but mm. they also have a common working language, which is English. And uh, this, this is unprecedented for the Chinese. Th if you need to have international cooperation, uh, language is, is one thing. But, um, but flying in outer space, there are just so many common languages that you know you can have body language, uh, can uh, can be quite sufficient to communicate with each other.